All right. Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. Make some noise if you're excited to be in church today. Yeah. It's a good day to be in church, man. We're beginning a brand new series. It's always great to begin these and launch into new teaching series here with you. Let me take a moment, just welcome everyone who's joining us online and everyone out in our courtyard. Uh, come on, help me welcome them. Come on, everybody. Welcome them to church with us. So glad you guys are here as well. If, uh, if you're new to Discovery, uh, we like to do uh, various methods of, of teaching, like teaching styles, and, and I'll do like verse-by-verse -verse studies, character studies, like Mo we've done like Moses and David and different stuff like that. We take sections of the Bible, topical studies. Um, so there's a lot of different methods of series and teachings that we'll do to just get the Word of God to you, to get His truth, to get his principles and, and what God wants to reveal to us every like week in series. This is a kind of a verse-by-verse -verse study. It's a book study, one that we hope is intended to kind of deepen you into your faith and into the Word of God. A lot more studious in this series. So how many are you ready to study the Bible for the next several weeks, okay? So this is one of those series that you can bring your, like, your Bible to church. Do you all still bring your Bible to church, man? I give you guys notes and stuff, and you know, I think that, that I love that you're using them, and I want you to use them, but you all know you can bring your Bible to church, right? Okay, And it's a good thing to know your Bible, and this is one of those, man, get to know your word, highlight it, and mark it up, man. Today we're going to begin this series on 1 John, a book of the Bible. It's a short book, five chapters, and so today just introducing it. I'm just going to like crack it open a little bit. The first like four verses and then we're going to like travel through John a little bit and show you like his reason and the purpose and the themes for John's writing. But let me kind of introduce it today. First John is obviously written by John, but this John is the apostle John. It's like one of the 12 disciples that walked with, with Jesus. At this time of his writing, it's about like 80, 90, 80, 100, somewhere around there. Um, he is one of, at this time, some people even believe he's the last apostle to be living. He was the last apostle to pass away. So this is, at this time in his life, this is John the Elder. This is John the Elder Apostle now looking at the church from the lens of like now second, third, there's like second, third generation followers of Jesus. So he's looking at like a spiritual father trying to help and, and father and shepherd this, this church. So I want you to receive it from that context that this is like a spiritual father writing to his church, writing to like Papa John. Can we call him Papa John? This is Papa John speaking to us, okay? Let's receive it from, from that. And he described, this is the John. John is, is, is the brother of James, the other apostle of Jesus. They were called sons of thunder. So they had like a certain personality that was, that was like thunder, that was like maybe a little abrasive or loud or kind of, uh, so, so he was that, so his writing is that way, man. He's going to kind of get in our business a little bit and he's going he's gonna to kind of challenge us and challenge the church that he's writing to throughout these five chapters we're going to study. He's the one who wrote the gospel of John and then he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and he wrote Revelation, the last book of the Bible about end times, which is, one of these days, I will bring a series of that on you. I know y'all want it. It'll, it'll come. It'll come as God. So this is like, like the, he is the second, you know, he wrote the second most letters of the New Testament only, only to Paul, who wrote, who wrote more than, than him. And in his gospel, John describes himself, like he describes himself as the disciple Jesus loved. Which is pretty, which pretty bold, you know what I mean? It's like Moses describing himself in Numbers as the, the most humblest man on the face of the earth which is pretty interesting to me, like to me, like if you're going to call, anyway, anyway, okay. So let me, let me introduce this, this topic, this, this letter, you guys. What's the big idea of John? Write this down. The big idea, like why John is writing this letter, he's answering the question, what does true saving faith look like? What, is it, what does that look like if someone really is a follower of Jesus? If you're not a Christian here today, you're not a follower of Jesus and you're watching this, you probably had moments where you've been around people who profess to be Christian and you thought to yourself, if that's what a Christian looks like, I don't want nothing to do with it, okay? So what, is that, what does it really look like? Or maybe you're here today and maybe you're doubting or you've had doubts like, am I really saved? Do I have true faith? Am I going to heaven? Listen to me, your, your doubts do not disqualify you for, or your, your faith. Doubt is not the enemy of faith. In fact, doubt is often a deeper invitation to faith. 
So it's okay that you have doubts, but John is writing this letter so that we would know what true saving faith looks like. First John chapter 5, verse 13, he tells us his mega theme in this letter. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may what? <clears throat> you know. He wants you to know this, man, that you would know you have eternal life. So, but why? Why does he write this letter, and why does John feel at this time in the church does he need to provide clarity to this? Like, what does true saving faith look like? Here's why. There were people at that time who were calling themselves Christian, calling themselves part of the church, calling themselves saved, yet they, they, they were trying to reshape some of the foundational truths of the word of God, of who Jesus was, of theology that John as was the, the initiator, one of the initiators of this movement, and he's seeing things they're trying to reshape and like what they believe. So they said like, oh, we believe in Jesus. These people of that time now in the church saying, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but it was a different Jesus that they were preaching. They, they had in this time, like they believed like legends started to set in second, third generation. So they believed that there was a Jesus, but he wasn't physical. He was like a phantom. He was a ghost. And he was not really a, a physical being. He was a, a spiritual being. So this was one of those things that, that Paul needs to, or I mean, John needs to address. Like, no, wait a second. This is, and one of the reasons why they thought this, that Jesus came just in like a ghost phantom, uh, you know, spiritual way, was because their belief that they were trying to infiltrate the church with was that only the spirit is good and only spirit can be good. Your, your body is evil and will always be evil. So they were redefining what holiness was. And holiness is probably not a popular topic in, in churches today, but, but it is an extremely important topic to the early church, and it's still an important topic today. Holiness, by the way, holy just means to be different. Different, separate, to be set apart. And so they go, yeah, yeah, we're holy, but holiness to them was redefined. They redefined what holiness meant. Holiness meant, yeah, we're holy spiritually. But in our body, our bodies are sinful and will always be sinful, and, and therefore, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. So they were doing all kinds of things with their body and calling it, that's fine, because my spirit is good. Your body, your choice. No, no, no. So, so there is there's some striking similarities to, to what they were preaching about Jesus. Like, like, he's just a good guy, and he's like, but he's, like, he's got good message and stuff like that, but he didn't come like physically. And, and what you do in your body doesn't matter, and what you, how you live your life, but as long as you love, as long as you're spiritually connected to God. And so there's some, there's some very, very similar, striking similarities to their day and what they're dealing with. And I think what John has to say to us. And, and it wasn't that they were just outsiders, like, like, you know, speaking about the church. These were people within the church that were preaching and believing that John felt it very necessary, threatening to the faith that he would write a letter to really distinguish what then does true saving faith look like. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, he says, these guys who were talking like this, you guys, who were trying to like lead you astray, they went out from us. They used to belong to us, but something happened. They didn't really belong to us though. For if they belonged to us, he said, they would have remained with us. But their going actually showed that none of them really did belong to us. Okay, so there's two themes, uh, I'm, two, two big themes that we're going to study over these next like five weeks together. That you're going to see interwoven all throughout this, this letter of 1 John. Here's the first one. Write it down. The first theme is that God is light. And, and what and what. John is going to connect this to, he's going to give us the test of our fellowship. Oh, you really, oh, you, you, you think you belong to the church? You think you belong to us, that you're part of the fellowship? Here's the test, because we're going to prove it. I'm going to show you how you can, John says, I'm going to show you how you know who belong to us and who don't, because God is light. And so we're going to study that. The second theme we're going to see is he says that God is love. And that's the test of sonship, that you are, you are a son or a daughter of God. Oh, you think you, oh, you belong to God? You believe in Jesus? He's your God? Okay, here's the test. This is how you know if you belong to us, if you're part of the fellowship. This is how you know if you truly are a son or a daughter of God. So today we're going to study the introduction and then the, the, like the reasons or the purpose of John's letter. So the first part of my message today is going to be very theological. It's, so it's going to be the study part, all right? And then we're going to jump into some very practical, some more practical stuff of why John is writing the letter. How many ready to study the Word of God with me, okay? Y'all ready? Okay. So John wants us to know this, okay, this elder apostle, he wants us to like have some things. He wants us to understand some things that he felt were very vital to our faith and to guard 
against some things that he felt were very damaging, dangerous, and detrimental to our faith. So let's jump in. First John chapter 1. We're just going to read the first four verses today, and then we're going to travel through different parts, and we'll, we'll, we'll take a good journey today. First John chapter 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. There's going to be different translations, but this one here is New Living Translation. He says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. So, so he, wasn't, he wasn't like created, like he didn't, he didn't begin when, when, he got, when Mary gave birth to him. No, no, this is the one. Guys, this is the one who was before. He existed at the beginning whom we have heard, we seen, we saw him with our own eyes and we touched him with our own hands. John is going, guys, this is real. This isn't, this isn't fantasy. This isn't illusion. He's not a phantom. He's real. And this faith that we have is real. He is the word of life. We're going to come back to that. Verse 2. This one who is life itself, like he is life, he was revealed to us. And we've seen him. There he is again. He's like, this is real, guys. And now we testify and proclaim to you that this one who is eternal life, he was with the Father. So like that's where he was. Before he was born, he was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. Verse 3, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. It's real, guys. He's, here he is going to keep going. This, guys, this is real. So that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 4, we are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. So John is looking out at the landscape of this Jesus movement that he was a part of from the beginning, second and third generation kind of now, and he's seeing a drift happen. They're drifting, they're, they're, they're shifting, they're, they're moving from some things that he, he thought were so detrimental, like if they didn't get some of these things right, and he's going, hey guys, this is real. This is a real faith. It isn't fantasy. It's not imagination. Jesus is real. And he changed everything. And if you let him, he'll change you. Like this can happen. So let me give you like the three, the, the three things we can see from this introduction about this real life that John now is proclaiming to the church that is drifting. Number one is this. Hey, if you're, if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. Okay. <laughs> Number one, this life that is real, this life was revealed. So in, in some of your translation, John likes to use that word revealed a lot, revealed, revealed. You're going to see. And if some of your translation, you use a different word. Look, at, I'm going to show it to you in New King James Version, in verse, verse 1 and 2. He said, concerning the word of life, the life was, and the word is manifested. Like this life wasn't hidden. Like God didn't hide himself from us. No, it was manifested. It was revealed openly. God has revealed himself. And, and throughout the Bible, we see that, that God is, the Bible says in Romans chapter one, that God revealed himself through creation. But creation alone could never display the love and the glory of God by itself. We're told that God reveals himself through his word, the Bible. But God's final revelation, his complete revelation is in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father, okay? Which, why he's called the word of life. It's the same title that John opens up his gospel with. If you're familiar with, with the gospel of John, John chapter one, verse one, he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's, that's it's a familiar title to John that he he. he kind of classifies, he calls, he gives the title of Jesus as the word. You know why? Like, why does Jesus get the title of the word? Here's why. Because Christ is to us what our words are to others. See, our words reveal to others what we think and how we feel. And Christ reveals to us and the world how God thinks and what's in his heart. What's in his mind and the heart of God. He is the living means of communication between God and man. So to know Jesus is to know God. So if someone is wrong about Jesus, then they're wrong about God. And so this is important that John would, would have to course correct because this is, this is everything. Everything is built upon this. Who is Jesus? Some people believe even still today, who is Jesus? Like he's just a man. They believe he's just a myth or he's just a, a, a legend. But this is, John had no place for those kind of 
teachers or that teaching. In John, 1 John chapter 4, he says, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. There are really four options. When you, when you think about who Jesus was, there's only four options that you can have. He's either a liar because he made some claims to be God. And if he knew he was not God, then that makes him a liar. It's not a good man. He's not a prophet. He's not a ghost. He's either a liar or he's a lunatic like he thought he was God and he's not. He's a crazy person. Or like the, the, this group, the church and this time that John's writing to, you could think he's legend. Ah, it's just legend. You know, a lot of myth has gotten in there over 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 time, or he's Lord. He's either a liar, lunatic, legend, or a Lord, and John would have none of it. He said, this is the Jesus I have seen, I have touched, I have heard. This is, he is real. And it's still today. The first John chapter 2, verse 22, he says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. What John was confronting here wasn't something that would go away, right? It's still today, this debate, like who is Jesus? Who is, who, who is the Son of God? So that debate continued all the way through the early church in A.D. 325. I know, it's church history. I told you, theological. You guys need this, though, okay? In A.D. 325, in in the Roman Empire, church leaders in the Roman Empire, or spiritual fathers, they got together to answer this question in Nicaea. And they were like, we got to answer this question because there's a lot of people who are preaching a different Jesus. And this is this, everything hinges upon this life, this real life that was given to us hinges upon who is Jesus. So they came up with a creed called the Nicene Creed. Maybe you've heard of it. If you haven't, it's really important because if you're going to have true and saving faith, then you're going to have to say yes and amen to what the, your spiritual fathers came to agreement to. You're gonna, it, 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 there, is, there is no other way to have true and saving faith is to say, so let me show it to you. I want to show you the Nicene Creed. I put it on your screen. Here's, here's what it is. Let me just read you what our spiritual fathers came up with to answer the question of the false teaching of Jesus. They said, here's the creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. This isn't our terminology of what you think of the Catholic church today. This means the, the one unified church, okay? Uh, okay. The one ap- Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, and everybody said, amen. amen. This, is, this is what, it, it would do you well to know who is the Son of God, to be able to accurately define who is the Son of God. That's true and saving faith is, is hanging on who is Jesus. Who is he? And, and John says, he's real. He was manifested. I saw it. I touched it. I heard it. He lived. He, he's, he's real. This is real. This life was revealed. Secondly, he says, this life, you can experience it. It's experience. You know, it's not just an intellectual thing. It's not just a knowledge thing. And I think it's this experience. You can click the next one. Boom. It's experience. It's experience. It's experience. Experience. Boom, there it is. Okay, this life is experience. Okay, so he says, so he says, he saw, he gazed, he heard, he touched. This is, you don't, you don't just have to have, not, you, it's not a knowledge thing. It's not an understanding thing. Like you can have this real relationship, okay, to which a lot of people think like, what, an, what a great advantage the, the apostles had to actually walk with Jesus, to see, to touch, to know that when I get a hug from, when I touch the shoulder of Jesus, I'm touching God. I'm sitting with God, and you think like, yes, that's such an advantage. 
But you need to understand that the 12 disciples didn't receive special impartation of the Holy Spirit because of their physical connection with Jesus. It was their spiritual connection. In fact, the, the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit that was given to them it was not revealed or released because of their physical connection. It was after physical connection with Jesus actually left did they receive the fullness of the promise of the Holy Spirit and were baptized in fire and power. It wasn't their physical connection. Listen, it was their spiritual connection. Hey, John is telling us this life can be experienced. It is real. Hey, we saw it. We felt it. We touched it. But after he left, he filled us with power, and he can fill you with power too. This, his life is real. He makes a difference, and he can make a difference inside of you. You can experience this life. And he writes this, he writes this letter to tell people how to know if they're really born of God, and he uses that phrase. You're going to see the phrase, Six times throughout 1 John, born of, of God. Um, in his gospel, John chapter 3, verse 7, he writes of Jesus speaking about this. He says, Jesus said, you must be born again. <laughs> you can have real life. You can experience a brand new creation. You can become brand new. This isn't just more understanding for you or more knowledge for you or some sort of behavioral or lifestyle change. No, God wants to, if you, to experience him to such a degree you become a brand new person. This life is experience. Jesus said in John 6, 63, these words that I speak to you, they are what? They are, they are spirit and they are life. So this, this, is, this is a spiritual connection. My word is spirit. And that spirit will birth life into you. You can experience this real life. And then thirdly, John is telling us that this life is shared. It's shared. Like once you experience this real life that Jesus has to offer, you can't help but to share it. You can't. We were just talking, last week I, I was talking to a few of our guys who come to Discovery. They're in, their, in, the, in a small group and they shared this testimony. One of our, our, our members, they, they have this barber. I got the same barber, by the way. He, he gave them a, an invite card. And we have these invite cards. They're called Random Acts of Kindness cards. They're out there in the lobby and they just say something extra to show you God loves you. And this guy, this guy goes to church. His name is Jason. He just gave it to his barber. His barber is far from God, doesn't know Jesus doesn't go to church, nothing like that, but he just gave him this card, and based on that card, he said, let me try it out. He came a, a little over a year ago now. He's been baptized. He's going to small groups, serving on team. He's actually a leader now at our Dream Center. This guy has experienced real life, real life. Like that's, it, this is real, and he changes everything, and we can't help but to share this life that we have. So let me share with you, like, throughout, like, the five reasons that that John is writing the letter. Why is he sharing this with this uh, new church? Throughout the letter, John tells us why he's writing. Like, in the context is important. You need to know the reason. Like, when you're studying the Bible, the context of, of the Bible is very important. Because if you don't know the context, you're going to put your context into the Bible, and you're going to misinterpret and misapply the Scriptures, like what God intended through his words. So we got to understand, like, What's the context? Like, why and who is John writing to? And that's why I'm beginning it this way today, so that we can study this well. John tells us throughout his letter five reasons why he's writing to a church who is drifting away, who is shifting away from holiness, from Jesus, from the life and the mission that God has called us to. Five reasons. Here, let's go. Write these down. Number one. John's writing this because he says that you may have fellowship. He says, look, I, I, I want you to have fellowship. Fellowship is God's answer to loneliness. This word fellowship, it's important who you're connected to. To John, he's like, you gotta be careful of who you're, you're connecting and who you're in fellowship with. The word fellowship is an important word in the vocabulary of a Christian. It means just simply this, to have in common is what it means, to have in common. John was concerned with who we were finding common ground with, who we were connecting with, who we were sharing our life with. In verse three, he tells us, we proclaim to you what we have seen and what we've heard so that you may have fellowship with us. 
like true fellowship to, to do life with, to experience authentic community with in a world that divides us. We live in a divided world. We're divided people based upon politics, our party, our personality, our culture. And John kind of is seeing some of this start to come to play. He says, no, no, this life that God offers, you can, it, it, we have fellowship and common ground. What do we have? We have common purpose. We have a common vision. We have a common cause. We have a common God that we worship. We can have fellowship. This is common ground. No matter your race or ethnic background or socioeconomic status or your culture, this is, supersedes it all. We can have fellowship with one another. And then he says this, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Wow, do you, do you see that? How in the world can we have fellowship with God? Can we have in common with God? Because the reality is, as sinners, we cannot have anything in common. We can't have fellowship with God. We can't have the same vision of God, the same purpose of God. But God in his grace sent Christ to have something in common with us. Christ took on himself a human body and became man. Then he went to the cross and, and on his body took the sins of the world. And because he paid the price of our sins, he made open a way for God to forgive us and to take us into his family that we would actually have fellowship, to have common, have in common with God. That's something within us that Jesus gives us, listen to me, makes us like God. This is what it means to have fellowship with God. This is what 2 Peter chapter 1 actually tells us. Look at it. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Here's what that means. God has given you everything you need to live for him. Everything. His power that lives inside of you has given you everything you need to live for him through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted us his precious and very great promises, so that through them, look what he says, you may become partakers of the divine nature. That word partakers, I included this Peter verse because that word partakers is the same Greek root word used in John's letter of fellowship. It's the same word that we can have, that we are partakers of divine nature. What a miracle. What a miracle that Jesus Christ took on himself the nature of man, that by faith we may receive the nature of God. Oh, wow, are you seeing this? This is the gospel. This is what John is reminding them, that you can have fellowship with each other and you can have a real life-changing fellowship, a common connection with God where he puts his nature inside of you, his power inside of you is real, and you can have it. He writes so that we would have fellowship. The second reason why he writes is so that we would have joy. Fellowship is God's answer to loneliness, but, but joy is God's answer to the hollowness and the emptiness of life. Joy is actually only used once in this entire letter right here in the introduction. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, we are writing, here he is again, all these are just, John's telling us why he's writing the letter. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. And I think it's perfect that John only uses this word joy one time because, listen to me, joy is not an action. It's not, it's not something that you can work with. No, joy is an outcome. Joy is a byproduct of fellowship with God. It's, it's, it's the outcome of it. Uh, David knew this in the Psalm 1611. He said, in your presence is fullness of joy. John wrote in his gospel in John 15 of Jesus when he spoke about the vine, he said, if you remain in me and my, my words remain in you. Now, in, this, in the context of this one, Jesus is actually preparing his disciples for his death and him leaving. He's saying, physically, I'm not going to be with you anymore. But if you remain in me, even though I'm not here, if you remain in me, in my words, the word remains in you. Look what he says. You can ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. That this word of life that gives us 
divine nature, partakers of the divine nature. His word is in me, and as I remain in him and his word in me, as I speak his word, it manifests in life. Now, I'm not saying this is name it and claim it theology. I'm just saying this is like, this is the reality of the gospel that we get to be partakers of divine nature, the living word that is life in us, that we proclaim his word and it makes a difference. It's real. You can experience this. This isn't just fantasy. This is real. And this works. He says, he, he, he continues, it'll be done for you. And then Jesus says, I've told you this so that your joy may be, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The world can't give you this joy. The world it can't give you the joy that God has to offer. There's this circumstantial stuff, but this is why John is writing this letter because it's a world of persecution and false teaching and, and it's, it's crazy. But, but in, in this real faith, you can have joy, real joy. Thirdly, John tells us he writes this letter so that we wouldn't live in sin. John faced the problem of the casual approach of a lifestyle of sin head on. I want to be very clear as followers of Christ, please hear me. You will never be perfect. You will always have sin. Okay, from until now, until we are glorified in our Christ-like bodies in heaven. We are going to be dealing with this thing called sin. In fact, in the next chapter, 1 John 2, 1, He says, my dear children, I write this to you. So every one of these, I'm just telling you, this is what John's saying, why he's writing. I write this to you so that you will not, what? Yeah, John's like, I'm writing this so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So Satan might be the accuser, but Jesus is the advocate. Okay, he pleads on our behalf and continuing forgiveness is the response to his intercession. That's God's answer to our sinfulness, the intercession of Jesus. There was a while ago, someone came up to me and they're like, Pastor, I really want to get baptized. I've been, you know, but I, I just don't know if I'm ready. He goes, he goes I just don't know if I'm, if I'm ready because I know I'm going to mess up again. I know I'm just going to, I know I'm going to sin again. So I'm just, I, I, and, I, and I actually shared with him this verse, and I, I shared with him 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, that, that this is something we're all going to be dealing with, but if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. And I told him, like, this is a journey. God will show you how to be victorious, but you'll never be perfect. And then I asked him, I said, have you ever had surgery before? Or no one had surgery? And he said, yeah, my dad had surgery on his knees, had bad knees. And, and I said, was there any, any like, uh, like a complication, like where they told you, like, hey, there might be some complications with the surgery. He said, yeah, yeah. But after the surgery, he just went into physical therapy, and he did the physical therapy, and he had to keep going in. And, and he was eventually, eventually able to walk well, and a light bulb hit him. And he goes, oh. So, so, so we, 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 go, we go to God to get saved, but, but I got to keep coming back to him to work out my, work out my salvation and, and be able to walk that out. And he's like preaching to me. I'm like, yeah, this is good, man. I'm like, come on, bro. I'm going to preach that one day. And there you go. I'm preaching. It. Christians, listen, Christians never become sinless in their time on earth. But they should sin less as they walk out their faith in Christ. I know that's not a popular teaching in feel-good Christianity. But John the Elder, Papa John, he, he, he's... He wants to come alongside you and remind you that this life is real, that it's possible, that that this life of joy lived not out of obligation, but of power and of gratitude, a gospel gratitude because Jesus died the death that we should have, and he lived the life that we should live as well, a life of holiness marked by joy and obedience, loving one another. Okay, here's the fourth reason why he writes this letter. He, he's writing as well so that, so that the church would not be deceived and fall into deception. Man, more than ever, people today need the ability to discern right from wrong, to discern truth from, from error. The philosophy of our generation is, is, is like there's no absolutes. There's nothing really that's always right, and there's nothing really that's always wrong. And... and False doctrines are more prevalent now than any time in history. Listen to me, Christ is truth, and Satan is the liar. The devil leads people astray, though, not with 
gross, like, out, you know, sensual sins and stuff like that. It's often through half-truths and outright lies. If you remember in Genesis, he began his career in the garden deceiving Adam and Eve. Has not God said you can't? Just twisting the word, just twisting the truth of God's word. People approach the Bible with this cafeteria approach. You know, I'll have a little bit of that, and I don't want none of that. Let me get, let me get that. And there's just so much deception that John is, is, again, he's the elder looking on at a church drifting going, that's, that's not how this works. Guys, this is, this is important. Your, your doctrine matters. Truth matters. Falsehood matters matters. And, and throughout the letter, we're going to see him address three types of deception. Three types. The first type, he says, others are going to try to deceive you. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, he says, I write these things to you. Again, he's telling us, he's telling us why he's writing. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. They're trying to preach and promote a Jesus in a way that he did not reveal himself. And no one has the authority to have a relationship with Jesus in a way that he did not reveal himself, in the way that he did not manifest himself. Others are gonna try to deceive you about what's good and what's right and what's wrong, and you, got, you, you have to discern. And then, he, and then not only is there others deceiving you, but John also is gonna address self-deception. In 1 John chapter 1, verse eight, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth isn't in us. And, and so he, he, he's, he's watching the church. He's saying, if you ever get to this place where you think that you no longer need deliverance, where there's no longer any work, any, any, anything that God is trying to mold and work out in you on your way towards glory to the end of this life, if you ever get to a point where you think, I'm good and I'm done, you have been deceived. You've deceived yourself. This is, this is, there's always work. There's that self-deception that he's going to address. But then there's also spiritual deception. He calls out the spirit of the Antichrist that we're going to study a little bit in this series in a couple weeks. I'll, like, what is that? What does that look like? How does that manifest in the church? Because that's, he, that's where he's at, the spirit of the Antichrist. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. The, this, this is the, the warfare of our time. It's the warfare of John's time. It's never stopped, you guys. This is the same battle that we're fighting. People just get redefining what this means and what, the, what it means to you know, be a man to be a woman, redefining who Jesus is, redefining what it means to be a Christian, redefining, let's just change the definition here and I'll just gather around people who just believe like me, think like me, and not put up what he calls sound doctrine. Truth matters. Truth matters to John as he's looking out on the church and he's, he's the elder apostle. He's, he's seeing that a, a change of guard happening. He's going, I see where this is leading. I see where this is leading, guys. And you need to be on your guard against deception of all kind. And then lastly, number five, he writes so that we would know that we're saved. As we read this letter, we're going to encounter this word no, that John writes no more than 30 times. This was important to John the elder for, for him to release something to the church. He wanted them to know, for them to to like understand, to have this assurance and confidence of who Christ is and who they are in Christ. No follower of Jesus, listen to me, no Christian, if they're asked like, do you think they're, you're going to heaven? No Christian should have to respond, I hope so. I really hope so. Or I think, I think so. No, like John is, is, is gonna help us to say, no, 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 there's a, there's a confidence you can have. It's not that you'll never have doubts. No, no, no. That doubts, remember, that doubt invites you to have a deeper faith. It's not that you never doubt. It's, it's, that, it's that you can have confidence in him and who you are in him. And throughout this letter, the answer, like what John reveals to us on how you can have connection with, you know, God and with others and guard yourself, it's the same three things and he interweaves all throughout this, this entire letter. Obedience, love, truth. Let me just give it to you now, and we're going to study it. We're going to, obedience. Oh, you want to know, do you want to know if you're his? Obedience. Here's the test. Obedience, love, 
truth. Oh, do you want to know if you have fellowship, if you belong, if you like, if, you know, obedience, love, truth. See, the, a spirit-controlled mind knows and understands truth. A spirit-controlled heart feels and expresses love. A spirit-controlled will inclines itself toward obedience. And so John wanted to impress that fact on us. That's why we're going to see throughout this series, we're going to see a, a, a contrast. He, he likes to contrast light, darkness, truth, lies, disobedience, and in obedience, love, hatred. We see the contrast all throughout what we're going to study. To John, there's no middle ground. There's no like, like you're just one side or the other. This real life that God has to offer, that you can experience, it begins with sonship and then expresses itself in fellowship. First, we're born of God and then we walk with God. Now, if you are a true believer here today and you're out of fellowship with God, you're out of connection, with God, it's for one of those three reasons. It's, you, you probably disobeyed God's will somewhere. You're walking intentionally in disobedience. And because of that, you're, you're not in the fellowship and connection with God like you should. Or maybe you're, if you're a, a true believer and you're not in fellowship with God, it, it, it might be that you're, you got issues and problems with other believers. disconnecting you from God or you have believed some lies of the enemy and therefore you're living out lies instead of truth and it's, you're disconnected from God because of it 1 John chapter 5 13 the verse we started with let me share it with you in the message paraphrase I love how he says it he says the purpose my purpose in writing is simply this that you who believe in God's son will know, I love this, beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life. And then look what he says. The reality and not the illusion. The, the real Jesus. The real life. The, the real experience that changes everything, that changes you, that transforms this reality. Changes everything. Papa John, John the Elder, is looking on and he's at the church, it's drifting. And he's, and he's trying to ride a ship before he passes. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.